through the hallways of academia and on the face of the moon the footprints of conquest haven't left us any room to say Greetings, and welcome to the 12th edition of Women's Liberation Radio News. This is our one-year anniversary edition. That's right, WLRN has been working together as a group of radical feminists for an entire year, thanks to support from listeners like you. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. This is Katina Hyman. I'm a black lesbian feminist living on the West Coast. Today's podcast will focus on gender identity politics and its impacts, both negative and positive, on our women's movement. We'll hear excerpts from an interview Thistle Pedersen did with school board candidate Tasha Rose from St. Paul, Minnesota. In addition, you'll hear excerpts of an interview with Renee Gerlich, radical feminist activist from New Zealand who lost her job at an art supply store due to attacks by gender identity activists and anti-feminist. Finally, we have some totally excellent radical feminist commentary from WLRN's Sekhmet Shiao. Stay tuned. But first, here are the headlines for Thursday, April 6, 2017, as prepared by Niall Pierce. Fourth Wave Now, a group that describes itself as a community of parents and friends skeptical of the transgender child teen trend, released a report on March 15th about Curtis Crane. Crane was profiled on Bloomberg.com in 2015 under the headline, quote, Meet the Surgeon Sought After by Transgender Men, unquote. And by transgender men, they meant women who are trying to pass as males through hormones, mastectomies, and phalloplasties. Crane is sought after in part because he will operate on girls under the age of 18. The Fourth Wave Now report read in part, quote, It has come to our attention that Dr. Crane has been the defendant in no less than six lawsuits during the last year. The suits variously allege medical malpractice, medical negligence, and or failure to obtain informed consent, unquote in detail very serious complications from phalloplasty procedures. To read an account from Max, one of Curtis Crane's underage female patients, as well as the court documents with the victim's names redacted, please visit fourthwavenow.com. Vice President Pence has been selected as this year's recipient of the first-ever Working for Women Award, presented by the Independent Women's Forum, a conservative think tank based out of Washington, D.C. that prioritizes the drafting and enactment of free market policies that supposedly help women and their families. Many women in women's rights groups have noted the preposterousness of the award, considering that Pence has spent his entire career working against women and not for them. The consensus among women and other civil rights groups is that the award is baseless and should not be taken seriously, as the Independent Women's Forum is likely just a front for the white male conservative establishment in the nation's capital. In a state notorious for its oppressive and restrictive policies that work against the safety and health of women, Texas lawmaker Jessica Farrar has recently proposed legislation that seeks to penalize men for engaging in masturbation on the grounds that such acts are harmful toward unborn children. Though Farrar and many other women are fully aware that the bill will never be enacted, its poignancy is important and worthy of more public discussion. Coming is no surprise to women everywhere. Recently, an all-male Saudi Arabian panel totaling 13 men launched the country's first-ever girls' council in Al-Qasim. 
Saudi Arabia is one of the most oppressive and misogynist regimes in the world that not only unabashedly advocates an array of violences against women, but has actually codified such behavior in their state law. When asked where the women of the council were, reporters were told that they were present, albeit in a separate room. On March 11th, the Guardian UK article exposed the conditions that thousands of Romanian women currently endure, suffering horrendous abuses at the hands of Sicilian men in exchange for farm labor jobs. Romanian women constitute a large portion of the immigrant population on the island and have been emigrating to Sicily in search of work. And while they have been given jobs, those jobs and the conditions they are meant to live in and endure qualify as modern-day slavery and a variety of horrible human rights abuses, including daily rape. Sicilian agriculture is the backbone of the Sicilian economy, and these women are the gears that generate that wealth. The annual Goddess Festival in Lafayetteville, Arkansas, held from March 17 to the 26th this year, released a statement on the 21st, explaining that the festival had caved to online pressure from trans activists to cancel a lesbian workshop titled The Disappearing L, Erasure of Lesbian Spaces and Culture. The workshop was organized by Ozark Radical Lesbian Feminists, a group of three women with over 125 years combined experience in the women's liberation movements, who asked that the event be open to women only, aka biological females only. The workshop was based on the work of Bonnie J. Morris, author of The Disappearing L, an adjunct professor of women's studies at both George Washington University and Georgetown University. Dr. Morris was scheduled to speak at the workshop. Local trans group Intransitive, which calls itself the Trans Empowered Movement Working to Support, Liberate, and Celebrate the Trans Community in Northwest Arkansas, scheduled a meeting with the organizers of the Goddess Festival. In a statement on Facebook, festival organizers wrote that they told Intransitive they were willing to, quote, make a public apology, unquote, to repost the workshop description to read, quote, cis women only, unquote, rather than, quote, women biological females only, unquote, and to sponsor further trans-related events, but that they were conflicted about Intransitive's demand that the event be canceled. In response, festival organizers say Intransitive withdrew its offer for dialogue. It was at this point that the festival decided to go ahead and cancel the lesbian workshop altogether. Quote, we hope we can all remember that we are all in this struggle together because that's what we need to to focus on right now, unquote. Their statement read in part. And that concludes WLRN's headlines for April 6th, 2017. We now turn to an excerpt of an interview Thistle Patterson did with feminist school board candidate Tasha Rose about her run in St. Paul, Minnesota. Tasha Rose is a radical feminist who lives in St. Paul. She knits, is a political rabble-rouser, and is concerned with all things education and feminism. She has six children and a husband, and keeps an otherwise simple life in the heart of the city. Here's a portion of that interview. Tell us a little bit about your run for the school board in your neighborhood in St. Paul. What happened when you announced you were running Sure. So I have been pretty involved locally in politics for a couple of years now, looking pretty closely in the DFL and sitting on my local Senate district planning committee and also really involved as a parent. I've got six children in our local school district and in the last couple of years there has been a lot of calamity. I'm sorry if there's extra noise. I've got littles in the vehicle. There's been a lot of calamity in our district because of a superintendent that we had. And a group of parents and grandparents and I worked together to put together a petition for her removal. Since that whole thing transpired, I've been really involved in finding out what the mechanics are of the financial operations of the district and disciplinary operations, et cetera, because, like I said, I've got six children in the district. Three of them are in school presently. And it's just been a difficult couple of years for the district. So when the chance came, actually last year, a former friend of mine ran for school board, and I was a manager of her campaign for that. And that got me really working towards wanting to be part of the school board myself, knowing that there would be seats available coming in 2018. So I thought really hard about it. I mean, it was like probably an eight-month process that I went back and forth with wanting to run and not wanting to run and timing's not right and I should run and, you know, just 
back and forth constantly. And then a good friend of mine was like, you know, this is the time that you should do it. And we talked quite a lot about it, and she jumped the gun and made the logo and whatnot. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll run. And we made the decision within a couple days' time and decided to announce on International Women's Day. And we wrote a pretty great speech. I, I'm proud of the declaration speech I wrote. I really feel like I hit all of the points that were really important for the status of the district right now. So we wrote this free speech and we announced on International Women's Day and it wasn't even a full 24 hours. I would say it was probably 12 hours and there was already some trans activists trolling the campaign page and somebody who I don't even know on Facebook had no mutual acquaintances with, but I have since found out we have several people connecting both of us. This person who I've never met in my entire life launched this smear campaign against me, saying that I hate trans kids and I hate trans people, and I mean, it just was instant. And then within 24 hours, there were hundreds of comments on the campaign page. It was insane. And were they pro Tasha Rose running for school board, or were they against your run? They were against the run on the sole basis of the trans issue, and it completely overshadowed anything else. And as a campaign, we decided we're not going to respond to these individually because that would just end up being a big pissing match trying to appease one by one each of these comments. So we settled on writing a statement. The question that they addressed was, do you support the policies of the district with regards to trans kids choosing the facilities that they want to use? And I made a statement that was very clear that I support the district's policy, and there's also a state law in place that would prevent any kind of discrimination based on even gender, not just sex alone. And we put the position out, and we also made sure to admonish the people because the amount of bullying that was attempted, now I, I want to state very firmly that I am nobody's bully victim, and I will not be anybody's bullying victim, but the attempts were made. And it was outrageous. And my campaign staff and I were, you know, Googling my name or searching on Facebook and whatnot. And some of the comments that we came across were absolutely stomach turning, physical violence, sexual violence, you name it. We've all seen it all. We've got screenshots of all of it. I was also accused of making that part of it up. Even though I made no personal commentary regarding any of it, I did state in the response, this bullying is ridiculous and how are we as adults going to be demonstrating to children how to not bully or how are we going to demonstrate to children who they can trust to come to when they're feeling bullied? Because just a couple of nights prior to announcing, I had sat in on a committee of the board meeting for the school board and listened to the Somali Parent Advisory Council talk about how their children are bullied and their children are being sent home from school being punished for being bullied. And it's like, okay, this is the culture we're creating because we're teaching children that it's okay to bully people and, and nothing's going to happen to the bullier. And that's exactly what the left is doing right now to anybody who doesn't fall in lockstep. And that's what was happening on the page. And I called it out, and then they just went off with that. She's like, oh, she feels bullied. It was just insane. It was pretty dramatic. You say that you want to be clear that you will not be bullied. So are you still campaigning and running for school boards? I'm not campaigning anymore, and the reason why is not because of the bullying, but because they've given us a bigger platform that's actually overshadowing the issues of the district. And I don't want to take away from what the district needs because, like I said, I still have children in the district. As a parent, the district can't fire me. As a parent, the activists can call me any name on a book, but that's not going to overshadow the issues that the district has. The school district is facing a $27 million budget shortfall in this next budget year, and we have no permanent superintendent right now. We do have three finalists for a new superintendent, though, so that's at least hopeful. But there's that issue. There's an issue of safety in the schools right now. Some of our schools aren't up to code. Some of the schools have lead in the drinking water. I mean, there's so many different things. There's a curriculum overhaul that needs to happen because we're a very large urban district, and we've got Somali families and Karen families and Hmong families. We're a very big immigrant hub in the United States. I don't know if you're aware of that. So we've got a lot of ELL families here that are being underserved, and we see it all the time with this issue, with the trans issue. Anytime there's anybody who speaks gender critically, any other issue gets steamrolled for this one. 
And I yes. don't want that to happen with the district if I were to somehow pull off a win. I do care very passionately about the district, and I have been at the school board meetings since the declaration, and I intend to keep going, and I intend to keep writing the letters I do and speaking at school board meetings, et cetera, because, like I said, as a parent, they can't fire me. They can put me under the, exactly. the gun, but as a parent, they, they can't touch me. So there's that, but then the bigger platform that they've given me, we're actually launching a website called One Woman Riot that's going to specifically address the issue of silencing women in media and politics over the trans issue. So that's kind of the broader focus that they've given us. This is my own venture that I'm creating with a couple of other feminist writers to specifically address this issue and bring it even further into light than it already has been. And that's the larger platform that is right. opening up now as a result of you being deplatformed as a candidate. Right, exactly. Bigger. You're no longer running for school board. No, I'm not. Not this time around. We're going to re-examine it in the next couple of years because there'll be another seat open in a couple of years. So that might be the time to strategize another run. I don't think that my character has necessarily been tarnished because there are lots of people who sent support and agreement. But overall, they're just going to overshadow every other issue that the district faces just because they don't like the fact that I am critical of gender politics. So. Right. Basically, they're making transgender activism and politics the center of every single thing in our leftist movements. And that has to stop because, like you said, there are immigrant families that need special attention in your district. There's lead in the drinking water at some of your school sites. These are very important issues that impact everyone. We can't put trans politics at the center of everything. And that's really what they wanted was complete repudiation for me to say, no, trans women are women and this is all fine and dandy to the expense of how many other students in the district. And I wasn't going to say that, and that's the focus that they were going to have. This is the only thing that's important to them. They don't hear you when you say, gender non-conforming kids, let's leave them alone. Let's let them do their thing. Let's not medicate their bodies and ruin their bodies long term for this short-term flight of fancy. They don't hear you when you say that. They don't hear you when you say, I don't advocate violence. They don't hear you when you say, I don't advocate current legislation about bathrooms because they're crap legislation. They don't hear any of this stuff because they don't want to. They just want to hear you deny science. These people are the climate change deniers of the left, you know. So hopefully a couple years from now, through websites like yours, One Woman Riot, that I encourage our listeners to look for, when and if you run again, maybe the left will have shifted. That's really the hope because we see so many people waking up to all of this now. Rachel Dolezal coming out with that interview recently, you know, a lot of people on the left are really starting to go, this is a bunch of BS. So hopefully that kind of encourages people to start using their brains again because until that happens, this is the quagmire we're going to be in.
That was Sinead O'Connor singing The Emperor's New Clothes. We now turn to an interview Thistle Patterson did with Renee Gerlich. Renee Gerlich is an untamable shrew and feminist based in Wellington, New Zealand, who writes a blog at r-e-n-e-e-j-g dot net. She also writes on arts and education and was a research assistant for the recently released social history documentary The Heart of the Matter which looks at the role of arts and education in New Zealand before neoliberalism. I'm Renee Gerlitt, and I am from New Zealand. I'm based normally in Wellington, and at the moment I'm speaking from Brisbane in Australia. I spend a lot of time writing and reading. I think that consumes me most of all at the moment. You are part of a group called Untamable Shrews. Could you talk a little bit about that group, how it was formed, and some of the projects that group engages in? I love how I love the Untamable Shrews. Um, they established officially in um, about September last year, and it's kind of just the right time, I think, because it seems like there were quite a few women working independently in different locations around the world doing like street art projects. I know I was already stickering um, in Wellington. I make these stickers that say women are not commodities and place them on sexist advertising and strip bars and places like that. So there was a contingent of Melbourne, lots of women doing similar work. And we created some online forums to come together and started tweeting our work from the same um, Twitter handle. And the group's just grown and grown so exponentially since it started. And now we just published our first theme, so that includes our writing as well. And there's a YouTube channel now too, just started the other day, so it's got a bit of a video of us doing some street art. We also had good representation at the International Women's Day March in Melbourne and the fallout from that has actually been quite mad. There's a group I think got the biggest sort of is most visible in Melbourne and the trashing of <laughs> of the women who are part of this group over there has been quite oh, just insane. They were sort of tearing up our signs at the march and stuff like that. They were tearing up your signs at the march? Yeah, it was quite crazy. In the days preceding the International Women's Day March, online we could already see that some of the organisers and people who were preparing to go were kind of using the march to mismake about radical feminists by, you know, posting comments and things to the march organisers saying, oh, we've heard that there's going to be some swerve there, meaning sex worker exclusionary radical feminist, which is just a totally ineloquent term to talk about women who oppose the sex trade and sexual exploitation. But they were trying to build these narratives about how they were afraid of us and afraid for their safety and the organisers were sort of participating in that. And then on the day, we were a group of about 10 and quite, you know, visible because of our signs. So they swarmed us and they ended up taking a few of our signs and, and tearing them up. They proudly made some tweets afterward about the handiwork and somehow they managed to do this while still maintaining this narrative that they're afraid of us and afraid of their safety when they're around us. So I don't know how they sort of put those things together. Where is this coming from? What is the root cause of their harassing tactics? I actually think about that quite a 
unlocks the most obvious root cause is just misogyny. If a woman doesn't accept her designated place in society, then the sex trade lobby, and especially those with vested interests, will, will make sure that she's forced to accept that place. I often wonder why it is that so many who we call liberal feminists are sort of picking this up so enthusiastically, and sometimes I think it's perhaps to do with a sense of powerlessness, maybe it's got to do with rising inequality, I'm not sure, that people want to feel politically effective, and we're easy targets. Could you talk about what happened with the Wellington Zine Fest, your response, and then you having to leave your job? I used to work at an art supply store, and I think um, probably early last year, I had already noticed that I sort of in my social circles started being watched by certain people who had probably decided that I had some views against prostitution and I was kind of starting to speak about them more and more as Amnesty International was looking like it was about to release this pro-prostitution policy and I was quite keen to get some conversations happening, especially because I know quite a few people who are associated with Amnesty International. Then around that time at my job, I sort of created this response to something. One of the university magazines published a story on how female students are increasingly entering prostitution in order to pay their way through university. And the piece in the student magazine was just so appalling in itself. I think the writer stated at the outset that he wanted to write about to sort of leverage the, you know, that sex sells, and so he was going to write any sort of found about five different students and then organise them according to archetypes and just create this completely pornified story about what is actually a really disturbing reality. But the cover image was manga style cartoon image of a woman being raped from behind while having her hair pulled by this kind of green menacing looking arm while she was reading a psych textbook and the students were really outraged and we had a really close relationship with those students at my shop a lot of them are art and design students so I ran a competition offering them a chance to improve on the cover and in response to that People who had already had their eye on me started saying, I'm only doing that because I'm a swerf. And they started boycotting the shop, which I thought was quite pathetic. And then the Zine Fest organisers. So the Zine Fest is an annual event where people in Wellington come together and they swap and sell handmade books. And I, I make some of those myself as well. And I had been supporting the Zine Fest as long as I'd worked at that art supply shop. And they sort of wrote me a letter actually about a month later, which made it seem even more frightful and gratuitous, saying that they no longer wanted a shop support. So I did have some indication, you know, that they didn't like me. But then when I registered myself later in the year, I still didn't expect that they would discriminate against me in such an unprecedented way. I think no one has ever been kept out of that space before. It's one of the most kind of accessible community forums, really. I registered and paid, and they wrote to me and said that they refunded my fee and that I wasn't allowed to go along to the Zine Fest. I had a zine that was composed of quotations from feminist authors, Sojourner Truth, through to Andrea Dawkins and Bell Hooks and Rachel Moran and Megan Murphy. And I had another one about the genocide in West Papua and a third one which is about peace struggle from the slave and peasant revolt through to today. So I thought it was quite significant to think the, that kind of work from a community forum. And then what happened at work, I actually went along to the Zine Fest anyway. I decided that I don't want to accept that kind of censorship. So I turned up and I put a picnic blanket on the ground and spread my zines on the floor. And it was really lovely that um, three or four people came to support me and hang out for the day. And I had advertised that as a Facebook event beforehand. Several people saw that and decided that their contribution to the world for the day would be to stage a counter-protest or occupation of my picnic blanket. I had about 
three people determinedly sitting there for about three hours just heckling me in quite ridiculous ways. And then because people seemed to be so upset that I went in spite of being banned, and they started going to my workplace and talking to this woman who was the new manager and she was quite young and I, I don't think she's that politically engaged at all but a lot of her friends seem to be liberal feminists so I think she basically was under peer pressure and afraid of what her friends would think of her if she didn't do what they wanted which was to put me out of a job so she just reacted by getting angry with me not seeking my side of the story and she left this paper trail. I could see that she was collaborating with organisations external to our workplace who I'd written some blog articles about. And, you know, she just started sending me home from work. She removed me from the Facebook page admin and started accusing me of misconduct that couldn't be substantiated. But the really hurtful Part of it was that because she couldn't pursue that line, it wasn't tenable, she actually dug up a mistake that I had made at work and slated it to make it look like I was completely untrustworthy and then started working with the owners in Auckland to get rid of me on that basis. And that was my big lesson about how witch hunts really work, is that they must make about you and they completely fabricate things but the really hurtful thing is the character assassinations and the things that they dig up about you in the human era that becomes basically no longer acceptable if you're a woman with an opinion you have to be on your best behavior at all times so as not to give people anything to work with well our detractors i mean you're calling them liberal feminists but i don't believe their behavior indicates any sort of feminism at all in fact, I feel that it's woman-hating behavior. So I would like to come up with another term to describe activists. Because they are active, they're taking action to tear down women and to harm the lives and reputations of women. I would like to hear more about who you think they are, how many of them there are, how are they getting funding, are they part of organizations, um, well, I think you're right about not calling them liberal feminists. I do normally refer to these people as liberals, but that's a really interesting question about how they actually work collectively because it really does seem like a social circle, ultimately. I used to work with a couple of activist groups that I can't really work with anymore, and they were sort of anti-militarism groups, and... I think a lot of the people as well move in circles connected to social enterprise. And I think in New Zealand as well, what's going on with the sex posse theme, you know, these people who say prostitution is empowering for women. The New Zealand Prostitutes Collective is our local sex trade lobby. And they started in the 1980s as a group of about nine women who were trying to battle the AIDS crisis. At the time, women themselves were criminalised, and so they were dealing with that alongside the abuses of Timps and Johns, and they were a genuinely grassroots organisation working in the interests of women. And I think they still leverage that, that, those sort of origins, and promote image of themselves as this kind of downtrodden, needy, organization. I don't know how that goes hand in hand with empowerment narratives, but somehow it does for people. But now they receive a lot of government funding and they're plugged into this international sex trade lobby. They have a lot of capacity to kind of position themselves as sort of like the church of feminism. Like there was an article that came out in one of the popular leftist online um, news websites called The Spin-Off after the sister march to the Washington um, Women's March in Wellington earlier this year. We were a woman um, journalist who was writing like a what now for feminism piece. Um, the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective said, if these women aren't part of your feminism, it's not feminism. I think that's general feeling that people have in Wellington. And I think a lot of women feel that if they don't kind of swallow all the narratives that the prostitutes collective promotes, then they can't be feminist. So, I mean, that has a lot to do with it. So, what do we do about this problem? 
how can we practically move forward with our lives? What are you doing right now? Do you have a job? How are you continuing to be an artist and make your art and continuing to speak out and express your opinions? How are you able to do any of that? I'm just, I'm lucky. And I feel like I'm one of those people that comes from that position of, I have certain privileges that I know not everybody has. And I feel like I need to use those to have conversations that are necessary. It's a really big risk for a woman to come out and say, look, I think a woman is an adult human female and our feminism needs to acknowledge that so that we can actually gather together as women and organise. If that's a really risky thing to do, then I'm sort of in a position where I feel like, well, okay, I'll, I'll take that risk. But I think as well, it's not sort of a calculated risk and I'm only just starting to get to the point where I'm having to confront the the real implications of that. It's been about a year and now I lost my job and I, I had to move out of my flat and move home because it was a really gnarly situation where I resigned but they had tried to fire me. I won't have a reference after being there for a few years and it would be really difficult to try and find another job straight away and have to try to explain or relay all that. So I just knew that I had to get out before I lost my savings and I moved home and decided to take advantage of some freedom, unexpected um, time and actually first of all started doing a lot more research into the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective and where they get their ideas and their history and the work of actually the man who is the programs coordinator. I read his PhD and then um, decided I need a break from all of this stuff and I've come traveling but I'm kind of in a way trying to put to the back of my mind that I have to think of all this real world stuff like how employable am I if you Google my name one of the first things that comes up is actually an online pack that was written by a trans person who is a spokesperson for the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective as well and says it pretty much makes me look like a serial killer and it's been signed by people from around the country in New Zealand, over 100 people who have agreed through this pact to sort of help withhold study opportunities, financial support and speaking opportunities from me. So. Just the fact that that's there doesn't make me look that right. appealing to a potential employer. So I'm actually just starting to try to understand what kind of position I'm actually in. I don't think I've fully grasped that yet. I think actually seeing um, the sorts of things that have been happening to you, Cecil, has really driven home to me as well, just how real this is. I think previously I'd kind of understood that this was about women taking calculated risks have necessary conversations and then just dealing with the fallout but I'm only just starting to grapple with the fact that this is dangerous stuff this can really destroy lives. I was talking to some of the other women from the shrews recently and one of them was telling me how like, every decision she makes you know if she's being you know harassed at a march or whatever she does she thinks about the fact that she wants to represent what we're trying to do in a way that makes it accessible for other women. And she said that, and I felt really sheepish because I was like, I don't do that. What goes through my head is I want to do what I would want more vulnerable and like a teenage girl to be able to do in any given situation. So if I get harassed, I want to be able to set firm boundaries. And other women come from the perspective of black sisterhood, And you can't do all of those things at once. But it's so beautiful when you're finally able to look at the work that you can produce when you bring all of these different approaches together. Really nothing can substitute for that sisterhood. And we have to keep looking for each other and um, finding ways to connect. To conclude today's podcast, focus on gender identity activism and its impacts on the women's movement, we hear from Sekhmet Xiao in our WLRN featured commentary. You are listening to WLRN.
Brought to you by the totally excellent radical feminists at Women's, Women's Liberation, Liberation Radio, Radio, Radio News. News. In a shockingly brief period, trans activism has moved from the fringes of a small subculture to the mainstream spotlight, and scores of liberals, who had never heard of transgenderism five years ago, are today making death and rape threats against any woman who rejects trans ideology or supporting those who do. While real radical feminism has never been popular, it is now being maligned, attacked, and censored with unprecedented hostility. Not by the right wing, not by religious people who believe that women are their husband's property and lesbians are going to hell, but by liberals and leftists who consider themselves advocates for women and girls against right-wing misogyny. The censoring and blacklisting of gender-critical women, gender-abolitionist women, and radical feminists exemplifies liberal authoritarianism, enforced through what author Lionel Shriver calls weaponized sensitivity. Gender identity ideology, which boils down to the personal feelings of individuals who are ultimately basing their sense of self on a false premise, has been made into a moral issue after the fashion of social justice activism rooted in identity politics. Instead of debating the radical feminist and gender-critical arguments about gender identity, trans activists and their supporters immediately attempt to discredit the women who make these arguments as fundamentally immoral, bigoted people. Gender identity theory is taken to be a universal truth beyond contestation, and anyone who dares to openly disagree with or even question it and the behavior of trans activists is cast as an unforgivably terrible person with an intensity that racists, homophobes, and old-fashioned misogynistic men still don't face. The mainstream and corporate liberal media and virtually all of the pseudo-feminist liberal websites geared toward women refuse to publish anything about the trans movement that isn't explicitly, relentlessly promotional, flattering, and affirmative. Meanwhile, feminist and gender-critical women face witch-hunting and harassment on social media and in real life simply for denying the trans gospel. This level of censorship, often achieved through violent and economic threats against the offending women, wouldn't be necessary if feminist and gender-critical views were truly hate speech. Homophobic hate speech, for example, has always been allowed at every level of our culture, but gay men and lesbians have never made the claim that Westboro Baptist Church-type vitriol about gays going to hell literally jeopardizes gay and lesbian existence without any physical or material action behind it. True hate speech against colonized peoples or homosexuality is based in subjective emotional prejudice, and while prejudiced speakers may face consequences for their speech after the fact, they're rarely silenced altogether or threatened to the degree that transcritical women and radical feminists are. Why the difference? Because the legitimization of transgenderism requires denial of material reality, any kind of speech or criticism that draws attention to the flaws, irrationality, and falsehoods of gender identity must be wiped out for the trans narrative to pass as truth. Gay men and lesbians don't need to fundamentally challenge and change what the rest of society knows to be real about the human body in order to feel respected or to have civil rights, and thus they never attempted to censor heterosexuals who rejected them but simply argue that they should have the same civil rights and overall security that heterosexuals do. Men who want to be perceived as women are not merely asking for acceptance, but for society to participate in the illusion they want to be real. Radical feminism, gender-critical views, and even the most basic acknowledgement of human biology all prevent the transgender illusion from becoming a collectively agreed-upon reality which is one reason why women who express these views are so viciously persecuted by gender identity cultists. Gender identity activism is the latest manifestation of the divide and conquer strategy that men have been using against women for thousands of years, giving us a new reason to make enemies of each other and move further away from global female unity that could seriously threaten male power. Feminism has always been a leftist movement, with liberal and left-leaning women being much closer to it than right-wing women. 
Trans activism is the newest weapon that liberal and leftist men are using to prevent liberal and leftist women from becoming feminists and building solidarity with each other. Nothing else in recent memory has been so powerful as trans activism to transform liberal and leftist women into aggressively anti-feminist agents of liberal male power. More often than not, it is women and girls who vote Democrat and falsely consider themselves feminists who threaten, attack, slander, censor, and witch hunt any woman who openly denounces gender identity and refuses to accept heterosexual men as women and lesbians. These misogynistic, lesbian-hating, anti-feminist women have been successfully recruited by the male-led, male-serving trans cult and the male liberals who support it. And instead of joining feminism and putting other women first, they make feminist women their enemies. Despite the fact that radical feminists have many political positions in common with these anti-feminist liberal women, far more in common than we'll ever have with right-wing women, we find ourselves targeted by them with a hostility they have never shown to men. It is because of their unbelievable loyalty to males that these women attack us, even as they make superficial complaints in Bitch Magazine and Bustle and Exo Jane about all the nonviolent ways men subjugate them. Not only do feminists lose the woman power, the numbers we so desperately need to build momentum for our movement when, the, when these liberal women betray us for men and trans activism, but we face yet one more group of political enemies, one more obstacle to making progress toward female liberation from male oppression. Liberal and leftist men have their women exactly where they want them, and all women are suffering for it. Gender identity activism exposes a truth about liberals and leftists that was previously a well-kept secret in politics. They are just as misogynistic and homophobic as their right-wing opponents, with the only difference being style. Trans activism allows liberals, so-called progressives, and leftists to be openly, unapologetically woman-hating and lesbian-hating, all the while looking and feeling superior to right-wingers who engage in the old-fashioned forms of misogyny and homophobia, now usually considered politically incorrect and lambasted by liberal and leftist women. You can call yourself a feminist while verbally abusing women online for saying men can't be women, and you can say you're an LGBT ally while bullying lesbians for rejecting men in drag as lovers, all the while thinking you're better and different than right-wing misogynists and homophobes. You can get away with anything as long as you do it in the name of transgenderism, never sacrificing any of your liberal, progressive, or leftist credibility, even if your harassment of women and hatred of feminism are identical to that of the right wing. If there is a silver lining to trans mania, it is this revelation of the left's pervasive misogyny and anti-lesbian hatred, and the resulting conversion of some women from, from liberalism and anti-feminist leftism to radical feminism. Liberal and leftist men are no less misogynistic than right-wing men. This has always been true and always will be. Their liberal and leftist politics do not change the fact that they're male. And their maleness, not their political party, is the root of their misogyny and hatred of lesbians. Too many liberal and leftist women buy into the lie that their men are less sexist, less woman-hating, and less homophobic than men on the right, and this makes it easier for them to believe that the liberal platform on women's issues is not only less misogynistic than the rights, but that it is feminism. Liberal men have co-opted and redefined feminism for their own male misogynistic interests, and by successfully selling it to liberal and leftist women, they have neutralized a majority of potential feminists, conning them into advocating a kind of liberal men's rights activism now packaged as feminism. Contrary to the opinions of liberal misogynists, feminism is and has always been about female liberation from male oppression. Given this definition, anyone who silences, threatens, attacks, stalks, or slanders a woman for expressing her pro-woman politics is not a feminist. Anyone who tries to change the meaning of lesbianism and bullies actual lesbians into sex with men in drag is not a feminist. 
anyone who seeks to destroy a woman's livelihood, social network, or sense of safety is not a feminist. Anyone who violates a woman's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, or sexual boundaries is not a feminist. People who engage in these behaviors are misogynistic, lesbophobic, rape apologist, men's rights activists, even if they vote Democrat, even if their politics are generally liberal or leftist, even if they call themselves feminists and LGBT allies. As hard as it may be to wake up and recognize just how deep and ugly the misogyny and lesbian hating is in the average liberal or leftist, Feminist women are better off for recognizing it, and we have gender identity activism to thank for exposing the truth. For many women, particularly young women, gender identity activism is ultimately what awakens them to the misogyny of liberalism and leads them into radical feminism. Ironically, gender identity activism just might be the thing that drives a 21st century radical feminist revival, even as trans cultists wage war against feminists like no other group has in the last 40 years. Moving forward, feminists must keep in mind that trans activism is only a symptom of the misogyny and lesbian hatred that have been deeply embedded in the liberal and leftist population, and in all men by default, since the beginning. And that concludes today's podcast for April 6th, 2017. Thanks for tuning in. It's only by your generous donations that we can make available the quality programming you have come to expect. If you haven't donated already, please consider donating to our t-shirts campaign. Once we get enough donations, we will buy station t-shirts and draw two lucky winners to send t-shirts to. Please take a look at our t-shirts tab and donate today. This is Niall Pierce, signing off for now. And I'm Katina. Thanks for tuning in. Please remember to share, like, and comment widely to get feminist news into the ears of women around the world who need to hear it. Thanks for tuning in to WLRN. This is Thistle Pedersen signing off. And I am Sarah. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please send us an email to wlrnewscontact at gmail.com. That's wlrnewscontact at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Stay tuned for next month's program to be released on May 4th about the debate among feminists regarding coalition building. This is Sekhmet Shiawal for WLRN. Today's program was produced by Jenna DeQuarto, our sound engineering goddess. Thanks for listening. Patriarchal kiss. How will we find what needs to be shown? And then after that, where is home? Tell me, where is my home? Cause gender hurts.